Chapter Three of Short Stories, An Unpleasant Predicament, Part One. This unpleasant business occurred at the epoch when the regeneration of our beloved fatherland and the struggle of her valiant sons towards new hopes and destinies was beginning with irresistible force and with a touchingly naive impetuosity. One winter evening in that period, between eleven and twelve o'clock, three highly respectable gentlemen were sitting in a comfortable and even luxuriously furnished room in a handsome house of two stories on the Petersburg side, and were engaged in a staid and edifying conversation on a very interesting subject. These three gentlemen were all of general's rank. They were sitting round a little table, each in a soft and handsome armchair, and as they talked they quietly and luxuriously sipped champagne. The bottle stood on the table on a silver stand with ice round it. The fact was that the host, a privy councillor called Stepan Nikiforovitch Nikiforov, an old bachelor of sixty-five, was celebrating his removal into a house he had just bought, and, as it happened, also his birthday, which he had never kept before. The festivity, however, was not on a very grand scale. As we have seen already, there were only two guests both of them former colleagues and former subordinates of Mr. Nikiforov. That is, an actual civil councillor called Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko, and another actual civil councillor, Ivan Ilyich Prelinsky. They had arrived to tea at nine o'clock, then had begun upon the wine, and knew that at exactly half-past eleven they would have to set off home. Their host had all his life been fond of regularity. A few words about him. He had begun his career as a petty clerk with nothing to back him, had quietly plodded on for forty-five years, knew very well what to work towards, had no ambition to draw the stars down from heaven, though he had two stars already, and particularly disliked expressing his own opinion on any subject. He was honest, too, that is, it had not happened to him to do anything particularly dishonest. He was a bachelor because he was an egoist. He had plenty of brains, but he could not bear showing his intelligence. He particularly disliked slovenliness and enthusiasm, regarding it as moral slovenliness, and towards the end of his life had become completely absorbed in a voluptuous, indolent comfort and systematic solitude. Though he sometimes visited people of a rather higher rank than his own, yet from his youth up he could never endure entertaining visitors himself, and of late he had, if he did not play a game of patience, been satisfied with the society of his dining-room clock, and would spend the whole evening dozing in his armchair, listening placidly to its ticking under its glass case on the chimney-piece. In appearance he was closely shaven and extremely proper-looking. He was well-preserved, looking younger than his age. He promised to go on living many years longer, and closely followed the rules of the highest good breeding. His post was a fairly comfortable one. He had to preside somewhere and to sign something. In short, he was regarded as a first-rate man. He had only one passion, or, more accurately, one keen desire. That was to have his own house, and a house built like a gentleman's residence, not a commercial investment. His desire was at last realized. He looked out and bought a house on the Petersburg side, a good way off, it is true, but it had a garden and was an elegant house. The new owner decided that it was better for being a good way off, he did not like entertaining at home, and for driving to see anyone or to the office he had a handsome carriage of a chocolate hue, a coachman, Mihay, and two little but strong and handsome horses. All this was honorably acquired by the careful frugality of forty years, so that his heart rejoiced over it. This was how it was that Stepan Nikiforovitch felt such pleasure in his placid heart that he actually invited two friends to see him on his birthday, which he had hitherto carefully concealed from his most intimate acquaintances. He had special designs on one of these visitors. 
He lived in the upper story of his new house, and he wanted a tenant for the lower half, which was built and arranged in exactly the same way. Stepan Nikiforovitch was reckoning upon Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko, and had twice that evening broached the subject in the course of conversation. But Semyon Ivanovitch made no response. The latter, too, was a man who had doggedly made a way for himself in the course of long years. He had black hair and whiskers and a face that always had a shade of jaundice. He was a married man of morose disposition who liked to stay at home. He ruled his household with a rod of iron. In his official duties he had the greatest self-confidence. He too knew perfectly well what goal he was making for, and, better still, what he never would reach. He was in a good position, and he was sitting tight there. Though he looked upon the new reforms with a certain distaste, he was not particularly agitated about them. He was extremely self-confident, and listened with a shade of ironical malice to Ivan Ilyich Pralinsky expatiating on new themes. All of them had been drinking rather freely, however, so that Stepan Nikiforovitch himself condescended to take part in a slight discussion with Mr. Pralinsky concerning the latest reforms. But we must say a few words about His Excellency Mr. Pralinsky, especially as he is the chief hero of the present story. The actual civil councillor Ivan Ilyich Pralinsky had only been His Excellency for four months. In short, he was a young general. He was young in years, too, only forty-three, no more, and he looked and liked to look even younger. He was a tall, handsome man, he was smart in his dress, and prided himself on its solid, dignified character. With great aplomb he displayed an order of some consequence on his breast. From his earliest childhood he had known how to acquire the airs and graces of aristocratic society, and, being a bachelor, dreamed of a wealthy and even aristocratic bride. He dreamed of many other things, though he was far from being stupid. At times he was a great talker, and even liked to assume a parliamentary pose. He came of a good family. He was the son of a general and brought up in the lap of luxury. In his tender childhood he had been dressed in velvet and fine linen, had been educated at an aristocratic school, and though he acquired very little learning there, he was successful in the service and had worked his way up to being a general. The authorities looked upon him as a capable man and even expected great things from him in the future. Stepan Nikiforovitch, under whom Ivan Ilyich had begun his career in the service, and under whom he had remained until he was made a general, had never considered him a good businessman, and had no expectations of him whatever. What he liked in him was that he belonged to a good family, had property, that is, a big block of buildings let out in flats, in charge of an overseer was connected with persons of consequence, and, what was more, had a majestic bearing. Stepan Nikiforovitch blamed him, inwardly, for excess of imagination and instability. Ivan Ilyich himself felt at times that he had too much amour propre and even sensitiveness. Strange to say, he had attacks from time to time of morbid tenderness of conscience, and even a kind of faint remorse. With bitterness and a secret soreness of heart, he recognized, now and again, that he did not fly so high as he imagined. At such moments he sank into despondency, especially when he was suffering from hemorrhoids, called his life une existence manquée, and ceased, privately, of course, to believe even in his parliamentary capacities calling himself a talker, a maker of phrases, and, though all that, of course, did him great credit, it did not in the least prevent him from raising his head again half an hour later, and growing even more obstinately, even more conceitedly self-confident, and assuring himself that he would yet succeed in making his mark, and that he would be not only a great official, but a statesman whom Russia would long remember. He actually dreamed at times of monuments. 
From this it will be seen that Ivan Ilyitch aimed high, though he hid his vague hopes and dreams deep in his heart, even with a certain trepidation. In short, he was a good-natured man and a poet at heart. Of late years these morbid moments of disillusionment had begun to be more frequent. He had become peculiarly irritable, ready to take offense, and was apt to take any contradiction as an affront. But reformed Russia gave him great hopes. His promotion to general was the finishing touch. He was roused. He held his head up. He suddenly began talking freely and eloquently. He talked about the new ideas, which he very quickly and unexpectedly made his own and professed with vehemence. He sought opportunities for speaking, drove about the town, and in many places succeeded in gaining the reputation of a desperate liberal, which flattered him greatly. That evening, after drinking four glasses, he was particularly exuberant. He wanted on every point to confute Stepan Nikiforovitch, whom he had not seen for some time past, and whom he had hitherto always respected and even obeyed. He considered him, for some reason, reactionary, and fell upon him with exceptional heat. Stepan Nikiforovitch hardly answered him, but only listened slyly, though the subject interested him. Ivan Ilyitch got hot, and in the heat of the discussion sipped his glass more often than he ought to have done. Then Stepan Nikiforovitch took the bottle and at once filled his glass again, which for some reason seemed to offend Ivan Ilyitch, especially as Semyon Ivanovitch Shipulenko, whom he particularly despised, and indeed feared on account of his cynicism and ill-nature, preserved a treacherous silence and smiled more frequently than was necessary. They seem to take me for a schoolboy, flashed across Ivan Ilyitch's mind. No, it was time, high time, he went on hotly. We have put it off too long, and to my thinking humanity is the first consideration. Humanity with our inferiors, remembering that they too are men. Humanity will save everything, and bring out all that is... <laughs> was heard from the direction of Semyon Ivanovitch. "'But why are you giving us such a talking to?' Stepan Nikiforovitch protested at last with an affable smile. "'I must own, Ivan Ilyitch, I have not been able to make out so far what you are maintaining. You advocate humanity. That is, love of your fellow creatures, isn't it?' "'Yes, if you like. I—' "'Allow me. As far as I can see, that's not the only thing.' Love of one's fellow creatures has always been fitting. The reform movement is not confined to that. All sorts of questions have arisen relating to the peasantry, the law courts, economics, government contracts, morals, and, and, and those questions are endless, and altogether may give rise to great upheavals, so to say. That is what we have been anxious about, and not simply humanity. Yes. The thing is a bit deeper than that, observed Semyon Ivanovitch. I quite understand, and allow me to observe, Semyon Ivanovitch, that I can't agree to being inferior to you in depth of understanding, Ivan Ilyitch observed sarcastically and with excessive sharpness. However, I will make so bold as to assert, Stepan Nikiforovitch, that you have not understood me either. No, I haven't. And yet I maintain and everywhere advance the idea that humanity and nothing else with one's subordinates, from the official in one's department down to the copying clerk, from the copying clerk down to the house serf, from the servant down to the peasant, humanity, I say, may serve, so to speak, as the cornerstone of the coming reforms and the reformation of things in general. Why? Because, take a syllogism. I am human, consequently I am loved, I am loved, so confidence is felt in me, there is a feeling of confidence, and so there is trust, there is trust, and so there is love, that is, no, I mean to say that if they trust me they will believe in the reforms, they will understand, so to speak, the essential nature of them, will, so to speak, embrace each other in a moral sense, 
and will settle the whole business in a friendly way, fundamentally. What are you laughing at, Semyon Ivanovitch? Can't you understand? Stepan Nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows without speaking. He was surprised. I fancy I have drunk a little too much, said Semyon Ivanovitch sarcastically, and so I am a little slow of comprehension, not quite all my wits about me. Ivan Ilyitch winced. We should break down, Stepan Nikiforovitch pronounced suddenly after a slight pause of hesitation. How do you mean we should break down? asked Ivan Ilyitch, surprised at Stepan Nikiforovitch's abrupt remark. Why we should break under the strain. Stepan Nikiforovitch evidently did not care to explain further. I suppose you are thinking of new wine in old bottles, Ivan Ilyitch replied, not without irony. Well, I can answer for myself, anyway. At that moment the clock struck half-past eleven. One sits on and on, but one must go at last, said Semyon Ivanovitch, getting up. But Ivan Ilyitch was before him. He got up from the table and took his sable cap from the chimney-piece. He looked as though he had been insulted. So how is it to be, Semyon Ivanovitch? Will you think it over? said Stepan Nikiforovitch as he saw the visitors out. About the flat, you mean? I'll think it over, I'll think it over. Well, when you have made up your mind, let me know as soon as possible. Still on business? Mr. Pralinsky observed affably, in a slightly ingratiating tone, playing with his hat. It seemed to him as though they were forgetting him. Stepan Nikiforovitch raised his eyebrows and remained mute, as a sign that he would not detain his visitors. Semyon Ivanovitch made haste to bow himself out. Well, after that, what is one to expect? If you don't understand the simple rules of good manners, Mr. Pralinsky reflected to himself and held out his hand to Stepan Nikiforovitch in a particularly offhand way. In the hall, Ivan Ilyitch wrapped himself up in his light, expensive fur coat. He tried, for some reason, not to notice Semyon Ivanovitch's shabby raccoon, and they both began descending the stairs. The old man seemed offended, said Ivan Ilyitch to the silent Semyon Ivanovitch. No, why? answered the latter with cool composure. Servile flunky, Ivan Ilyitch thought to himself. They went out at the front door. Semyon Ivanovitch's sledge with a grey, ugly horse drove up. "'What the devil? What has Trifon done with my carriage?' cried Ivan Ilyitch, not seeing his carriage. The carriage was nowhere to be seen. Stepan Nikiforovitch's servant knew nothing about it. They appealed to Varlam, Semyon Ivanovitch's coachman and received the answer that he had been standing there all the time, and that the carriage had been there, but now there was no sign of it. An unpleasant predicament, Mr. Shipolenko pronounced. Shall I take you home? Scoundrelly people, Mr. Pralinsky cried with fury. He asked me, the rascal, to let him go to a wedding close here in the Petersburg side. Some crony of his was getting married, deuce take her. I sternly forbade him to absent himself, and now I'll bet he has gone off there. He certainly has gone there, sir, observed Varlam, but he promised to be back in a minute, to be here in time, that is. Well, there it is. I had a presentiment that this would happen. I'll give it to him. You'd better give him a good flogging once or twice at the police station. Then he will do what you tell him, said Semyon Ivanovitch as he wrapped the rug round him. Please don't you trouble, Semyon Ivanovitch. Well, won't you let me take you along? Merci, bon voyage. Semyon Ivanovitch drove off, while Ivan Ilyitch set off on foot along the wooden pavement, conscious of a rather acute irritation. Yes, indeed, I'll give it to you now, you rogue. I am going on foot on purpose to make you feel it, to frighten you. He will come back and hear that his master has gone off on foot the blackguard. Ivan Ilyitch had never abused anyone like this, but he was greatly angered, and besides, there was a buzzing in his head. He was not given to drink, so five or six glasses soon affected him. But the night was enchanting. 
There was a frost, but it was remarkably still, and there was no wind. There was a clear, starry sky. The full moon was bathing the earth in a soft, silver light. It was so lovely that after walking some fifty paces, Ivan Ilyitch almost forgot his troubles. He felt particularly pleased. People quickly change from one mood to another when they are a little drunk. He was even pleased with the ugly little wooden houses of the deserted street. It's really a capital thing that I am walking, he thought. It's a lesson to Trifon and a pleasure to me. I really ought to walk oftener, and I shall soon pick up a sledge on the great prospect. It's a glorious night. What little houses they all are. I suppose small fry live here, clerks, tradesmen, perhaps. That's Stepan Nikiforovitch. What reactionaries they all are, those old fogies. Fogies, yes, c'est le mot. He is a sensible man, though. He has that bon sens, sober, practical understanding of things. But they are old, old. There is a lack of, what is it? There is a lack of something. We shall break down. What did he mean by that? He actually pondered when he said it. He didn't understand me a bit. And yet, how could he help understanding? It was more difficult not to understand it than to understand it. The chief thing is that I am convinced, convinced in my soul. Humanity, the love of one's kind, restore a man to himself, revive his personal dignity, and then, when the ground is prepared, get to work. I believe that's clear. Yes, allow me, Your Excellency. Take a syllogism, for instance. We meet, for instance, a clerk, a poor downtrodden clerk. Well, who are you? Answer, a clerk. Very good, a clerk. Further, what sort of clerk are you? Answer, I am such and such a clerk, he says. Are you in the service? I am. Do you want to be happy? I do. What do you need for happiness? This and that. Why? Because, and there, the man understands me with a couple of words. The man's mine. The man is caught, so to speak, in a net, and I can do what I like with him. That is for his good. Horrid man, that Semyon Ivanovitch. And what a nasty fizz he has. Flog him in the police station. He said that on purpose. No, you are talking rubbish. You can flog, but I'm not going to. I shall punish Trifon with words. I shall punish him with reproaches. He will feel it. As for flogging, hmm, it's an open question. Hmm. What about going to Emirates? Oh, damnation take it, the cursed pavement, he cried out, suddenly tripping up. And this is the capital. Enlightenment. One might break one's leg. Hmm. I detest that Semyon Ivanovitch, a most revolting fizz. He was chuckling at me just now when I said they would embrace each other in a moral sense. Well, and they will embrace each other. And what's that to do with you? I'm not going to embrace you. I'd rather embrace a peasant. If I meet a peasant, I shall talk to him. I was drunk, though, and perhaps did not express myself properly. Possibly I'm not expressing myself rightly now. Hmm. I shall never touch wine again. In the evening you babble, and next morning you are sorry for it. After all, I am walking quite steadily, but they are all scoundrels anyhow. So Ivan Ilyitch meditated incoherently and by snatches as he went on striding along the pavement. The fresh air began to affect him, set his mind working. Five minutes later he would have felt soothed and sleepy, but all at once, scarcely two paces from the great prospect, he heard music. He looked round. On the other side of the street, in a very tumble-down looking long wooden house of one story, there was a great fete. There was the scraping of violins, and the droning of a double bass, and the squeaky tooting of a flute playing a very gay quadrille tune. Under the window stood an audience, mainly of women in wadded pelisses with kerchiefs on their heads. They were straining every effort to see something through a crack in the shutters. Evidently there was a gay party within. 
the sound of the thud of dancing feet reached the other side of the street. Ivan Ilyitch saw a policeman standing not far off and went up to him. "'Whose house is that, brother?' he asked, flinging his expensive fur coat open just far enough to allow the policeman to see the imposing decoration on his breast. "'It belongs to the registration clerk, Seldonimov,' answered the policeman, drawing himself up instantly, discerning the decoration. "'Seldonimov? Bah! Seldonimov, what is he up to? Getting married?' Yes, your honor, to a daughter of a titular councillor, Lakopateyev, a titular councillor, used to serve in the municipal department. That house goes with the bride. So that now the house is Seldonimov's and not Mlakopateyev's? Yes, Seldonimov's, your honor. It was Mlakopateyev's, but now it is Seldonimov's. Hmm. I am asking you, my man, because I am his chief. I am a general in the same office in which Seldonimov serves. Just so, Your Excellency. The policeman drew himself up more stiffly than ever, while Ivan Ilyitch seemed to ponder. He stood still and meditated. Yes, Seldonimov really was in his department and in his own office. He remembered that. He was a little clerk with a salary of ten rubles a month. As Mr. Pralinsky had received his department very lately, he might not have remembered precisely all his subordinates, but Seldonimov he remembered just because of his surname. It had caught his eye from the very first, so that at the time he had had the curiosity to look with special attention at the possessor of such a surname. He remembered now a very young man with a long hooked nose, with tufts of flaxen hair, lean and ill-nourished, in an impossible uniform, and with unmentionables so impossible as to be actually unseemly. He remembered how the thought had flashed through his mind at the time. Shouldn't he give the poor fellow ten roubles for Christmas to spend on his wardrobe? But as the poor fellow's face was too austere and his expression extremely unprepossessing, even exciting repulsion, the good-natured idea somehow faded away of itself, so Seldonimov did not get his tip. He had been the more surprised when this same Seldonimov had, not more than a week before, asked for leave to be married. Ivan Ilyitch remembered that he had somehow not had time to go into the matter, so that the matter of the marriage had been settled offhand, in haste. But yet he did remember exactly that Seldonimov was receiving a wooden house and four hundred roubles in cash as dowry with his bride. The circumstance had surprised him at the time. He remembered that he had made a slight jest over the juxtaposition of the names Seldonimov and Nekopateyev. He remembered all that clearly. He recalled it and grew more and more pensive. It is well known that whole trains of thought sometimes pass through our brains instantaneously as though they were sensations without being translated into human speech, still less into literary language. But we will try to translate these sensations of our heroes and present to the reader at least the kernel of them, so to say, what was most essential and nearest to reality in them. For many of our sensations, when translated into ordinary language, seem absolutely unreal. That is why they never find expression, though everyone has them. Of course, Ivan Ilyich's sensations and thoughts were a little incoherent, but you know the reason. Why, flashed through his mind, here we all talk and talk, but when it comes to action it all ends in nothing. Here, for instance, take this Seldonimov. He has just come from his wedding full of hope and excitement, looking forward to his wedding feast. This is one of the most blissful days of his life. Now he is busy with his guests, is giving a banquet, a modest one, poor but gay and full of genuine gladness. What if he knew that at this very moment I, I, his superior, his chief, am standing by his house listening to the music? Yes, really, how would he feel? No, what would he feel if I suddenly walked in? Hmm, of course, at first he would be frightened, he would be dumb with embarrassment, I should be in his way, and perhaps should upset everything. 
Yes, that would be so if any other general went in, but not I. That's a fact, anyone else, but not I. Yes, Stepan Nikiforovitch, you did not understand me just now, but here is an example ready for you. Yes, we all make an outcry about acting humanely, but we are not capable of heroism, of fine actions. What sort of heroism? This sort. Consider, in the existing relations of the various members of society, for me, for me, after midnight to go in to the wedding of my subordinate, a registration clerk, at ten roubles the month, why, it would mean embarrassment, a revolution, the last days of Pompeii, a nonsensical folly, no one would understand it. Stepan Nikiforovitch would die before he understood it. Why, he said we should break down. Yes, but that's you, old people, inert, paralytic people. But I shan't break down. I will transform the last day of Pompeii to a day of the utmost sweetness for my subordinate, and a wild action to an action normal, patriarchal, lofty, and moral. How? Like this. Kindly listen. Here, I go in, suppose. They are amazed, leave off dancing, look wildly at me, draw back. Quite so, but at once I speak out. I go straight up to the frightened Seldonimov, and with a most cordial, affable smile, in the simplest words I say, This is how it is, I have been at His Excellency Stepan Nikiforovitch's, I expect you know, close here in the neighborhood. Well then, lightly, in a laughing way, I shall tell him of my adventure with Trifon. From Trifon I shall pass on to saying how I walked here on foot. Well, I heard music, I inquired of a policeman, and learned, brother, that it was your wedding. Let me go in, I thought, to my subordinates. Let me see how my clerks enjoy themselves, and celebrate their wedding. I suppose you won't turn me out? Turn me out? What a word for a subordinate! How the devil could he dream of turning me out? I fancy that he would be half crazy, that he would rush headlong to seat me in an armchair, would be trembling with delight, would hardly know what he was doing for the first minute. Why, what can be simpler, more elegant, than such an action? Why did I go in? That's another question. That is, so to say, the moral aspect of the question. That's the pith. Hmm. What was I thinking about? Yes. Well, of course they will make me sit down with the most important guest, some titular counselor or a relation who's a retired captain with a red nose. Gogol describes these eccentrics so capitally. Well, I shall make acquaintance, of course, with the bride. I shall compliment her. I shall encourage the guests. I shall beg them not to stand on ceremony, to enjoy themselves, to go on dancing. I shall make jokes. I shall laugh. In fact, I shall be affable and charming. I am always affable and charming when I am pleased with myself. Hmm. The point is that I believe I am still a little, well, not drunk exactly, but... Of course, as a gentleman, I shall be quite on an equality with them and shall not expect any especial marks of... But morally, morally, it is a different matter. They will understand and appreciate it. My actions will evoke their nobler feelings. Well, I shall stay for half an hour, even for an hour. I shall leave, of course, before supper, but they will be bustling about, baking and roasting, they will be making low bows, but I will only drink a glass, congratulate them, and refuse supper. I shall say, business. And as soon as I pronounce the word business, all of them will at once have sternly respectful faces. By that I shall delicately remind them that there is a difference between them and me, the earth and the sky. It is not that I want to impress that on them, but it must be done. It's even essential, in a moral sense, when all is said and done. I shall smile at once, however, I shall even laugh, and then they will all pluck up courage again. I shall jest a little again with the bride. Hmm, I may even hint that I shall come again in just nine months to stand godfather. <laughs> and she will be sure to be brought to bed by then. They multiply, you know, like rabbits. And they will all roar with laughter, and the bride will blush. I shall kiss her feelingly on the forehead, even give her my blessing, and next day my exploit will be known at the office. 
Next day I shall be stern again. Next day I shall be exacting again, even implacable. But they will all know what I am like. They will know my heart. They will know my essential nature. He is stern as chief, but as a man he is an angel. And I shall have conquered them. I shall have captured them by one little act which would never have entered your head. They would be mine. I should be their father. They would be my children. Come now, your excellency, Stepan Nikiforovitch, go and do likewise. But do you know, do you understand that Seldonimov will tell his children how the general himself feasted and even drank at his wedding? Why, you know, those children would tell their children, and those would tell their grandchildren as a most sacred story, that a grand gentleman, a statesman, and I shall be all that by then, did them the honor, and so on, and so on. Why, I am morally elevating the humiliated, I restore him to himself. Why, he gets a salary of ten roubles a month. If I repeat this five or ten times, or something of the sort, I shall gain popularity all over the place. My name will be printed on the hearts of all, and the devil only knows what will come of that popularity. These, or something like these, were Ivan Ilyich's reflections. A man says all sorts of things sometimes to himself, gentlemen, especially when he is in rather an eccentric condition. All these meditations passed through his mind in something like half a minute, and of course he might have confined himself to these dreams, and after mentally putting Stepan Nikiforovitch to shame, have gone very peacefully home and to bed and he would have done well. But the trouble of it was that the moment was an eccentric one. As ill luck would have it, at that very instant, the self-satisfied faces of Stepan Nikiforovitch and Semyon Ivanovitch suddenly rose before his heated imagination. We shall break down, repeated Stepan Nikiforovitch, smiling disdainfully. <laughs> Semyon Ivanovitch seconded him with his nastiest smile. Well, we'll see whether we do break down, Ivan Ilyich said resolutely, with a rush of heat to his face. He stepped down from the pavement, and with resolute steps, went straight across the street towards the house of his registration clerk, Seldonimov. End of chapter 3